Hey everyone, I'm Ariana Parks, physical therapist, and today I interview Dana Green, and he's going to talk about private practice and MDT. Dana is a physical therapist and has been practicing since 1986. Dana became diplomat in mechanical diagnosis and therapy in 1990 in New Zealand and has been teaching McKenzie courses for 30 years now. Dana owns and practices at his private clinic. In our discussion today, you are going to learn about recommendations for anyone who wants to own a clinic, about his business model and referral sources, how to sell a home exercise program to a patient, and why back pain hasn't gotten better outcomes in the PT world. So if you feel this information is valuable, please consider subscribing to our channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, giving a thumbs up, and sharing with other clinicians that you feel might benefit from this conversation. I hope you enjoyed the show. PT Pro Talk podcast is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Fitter First, your first choice for the best Canadian-made rehab and fitness products since 1985. Hi, Dana. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Beautiful. Thanks for having me. Finally, good to meet you. Yes. It's been a while and I got you here, so I'm, I'm glad to have you. You are persistent. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I am very persistent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's start talking a little bit about yourself and your background for the ones that don't know you. Sure. I... Um... So I went to University of Buffalo and uh, PT school where I learned nothing. I really didn't learn much of anything. And uh, now it was a long, I graduated in 1986. So we didn't know a whole lot then either. I, I was given a, a, a an inflammatory model for back pain. So modalities, increased circulation, decreased circulation. So I didn't learn a whole hell of a lot. And, you know, graduated from and got a, my first job was at Millard Fillmore Hospital in Buffalo, New York. So we saw inpatients half the day, outpatients half the day. And, uh, you know, and I, I was ill-equipped to handle the outpatients. There was a lot of back pain, you know, and we all did the same. You do all these tests, all these special tests, but plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And then they all got the same treatment. We heated them, we ultrasounded them, we put electricity on them, you know, maybe had them pull their knees to their chest a few times. And I felt like I wasn't doing very much for them. Uh, the, 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 the inpatients, we literally dragged these poor patients across the gym three times. And when they got dragged, they're mandatory three times. They could go back up to their room. And I just, I don't know. I, I'm not this, anybody who knows me will verify I'm not all that smart, you know, but I'm not, the, I'm not that stupid either. And I wasn't going to spend my rest of my, and I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life doing that. Um, nobody really impressed me that they knew what they were doing. Um, except for one guy who I'll mention in, in a minute. And, um, I don't know. Everybody just had these beliefs, you know, if you believe the sacroiliac joint was the problem, they were all into that. And, you know, I didn't, that didn't make much sense to me. I couldn't feel what they thought they were feeling. Same patient, somebody else, oh, it's a, it's, it's a facet joint. It just seemed mysterious. And I said, I, I, I can't do this. And the only, my only experience was the, the hospital. So I figured I might as well run the hospital. So I, I took the GMANS and I applied to MBA school. And I went to MBA school for one night. Um, yes, I, I dropped out after one night when I had just taken my first part A class. So, uh, Ron Shank, I did, do, are you familiar with Ron? So, so yeah, so Ron, Ron's been great with the Institute, great for the Institute, but I, he and I worked our first job together and he, he had experience and he did seem to have a handle on what he was doing. And he said, listen, I do a lot of different things, but the basis for what I do is all McKenzie. You got to take a McKenzie class. So I sat in part A, you know, thinking, you know, why wasn't I taught this stuff? You know, I mean, so here's an instructor seemed to have a better grasp on this stuff than anybody I'd seen, was was willing to treat patients, evaluate and treat patients in front of a group, bring them back the next day. 
Gee, a real novel concept, right? Move them, move them around, find out what hurts them. Geez, maybe you should stop that for a little bit. Let's find out what makes you better and do a whole lot of that. It just, it didn't seem like it was controversial. It seemed like it made sense. It seemed like it was effective. So I dropped out of MBA school after one night and took part B as soon as I could and part C and then part D. And after two years, I finished the classes and never talked to the professors. Now, Wayne, Wayne Rath was my instructor for part A, B, and C. Ace Neem was my part D instructor, but I never talked to him. I just took the class. And when I was done, I wrote a letter to the McKenzie Institute, wrote, wrote a letter to New Zealand and said, this has changed my career path. You're like, can I spend some time in your clinic and observe? And it was the only time in my life where my time was right on the butt because he sent me a letter back and said, we're, we're putting together a formal training program. Here's an application. I filled it out and sent it back. And... Um, Myself and Ron Bybee, we were, we were the first two in the whole world to go do it. And, and as a result, as a result, listen to this, as a result, it was free. We didn't have to pay. <laughs> they paid for my flights. They gave me a car to oh, drive. Oh, my goodness. They paid for the gas in the car. And, and, they gave awesome. us, and they gave us $200 a week to, 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 to eat. And um, Oh, wow. I mean, so it was just, you know. What a one, deal. What's the world time opportunity? And uh, when I came back, I contacted the instructor, uh, Wayne, who, who took my, who I took my classes from, and he said he was doing a course in New Orleans if I'd like to come and help him. So I followed Wayne around for a couple of years and uh, spent some time with Dan Kelly, and uh, they were all so helpful. And uh, so after doing that for a couple of years, I taught my first Part A class in New Jersey in 1993. So it was just 30 years, 30 years ago last month I've been teaching. So it's crazy. Yeah. Wow. So, yes, a long, long time. Long time. Um, I'm from Buffalo. I moved to Syracuse 25 years ago to, to, to work with Wayne. And then myself and my partner, Michael Hope, we bought Wayne out in 2001. And we've been in you know private practice ever since. So we started with one office. We have four. And um, yeah, working in the clinic every day. You know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the trenches. I, I, so when I teach a class, I tell everybody, I got the same problems you guys got, you know, the, the same struggles, the same patients from hell that you have. I got the same ones, you know I mean? It's, uh, I, I'm not teaching from a, from a, from a, from a laboratory, you know, or, and in, or, or working in a laboratory and then teaching, I, I'm in the same clinic the same way they are. So, so that's the story. That's awesome. And, and. It's so good that you're still like seeing patients so you can relate to the questions and the struggles because I didn't you you think I'm too old to treat patients? Like it, it's you're you're saying that like, oh it's good that you're still seeing patients. It's it's good that you're still <laughs> uh that's 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 awesome. And thirty years teaching. So So Robert a, at, Robert started a year before I did it. We just had this conversation not too long ago. You know, when we first started out, we were so young and everybody was like, oh my God, I can't believe you're so lucky. You're so young to be doing this. How did you get into this so early? And before you know it, we're, we're the old guys on the block. Like, I, I remember being young. I know I'm old now, but I don't remember the middle part. It just went by so fast. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and so now moving to the, the business part. So you have your, your you own your, pra your practice, right? Correct. Um, so one of the questions from our audience that I'm collecting. So if people want to send me questions, I have a survey that people can go and let their thoughts, let me know their thoughts and questions that I can ask my guests. But one of them is about what are your top three recommendations for anyone who wants to own a private practice? Oh, um, so you, you, you really have to want to do it. You know, I mean, the, the, you can't be on the fence. You can't do it halfway. You, you've got to do it. Uh, you got to do it all the way. Um, and you got to be passionate about it. Um, you know, you, you, you have to love it. See, I had no choice. I don't know about anything else except this. That's all I know with PT. I, and if, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it as well as I can. And you, you just have to be committed. I mean, I, I feel like people can dip their foot in the water a little bit, do, you know, do a little bit. I think you got, you got to do it all the way. Um, but it's all consuming, you know, it's all consuming. The, 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 the people management, there's patient management. Um, and I'm just, you know, we're, we're in a tough market here in, in, in 
central New York. We're, we're very low paid. When we compare what we, we what, what other therapists get national. And um, so we got to be busy. You, you got to hustle. Um, boy, I, as far as recommend, you, again, you got you to be sure that's what you want. You got number one. I think you got to have a mentor, right? Regardless of whether you own your practice, or just a PT in general. You got to have somebody who's been there before you did. Um, what questions have they, or what problems have they had? Um, you got to have somebody to learn from. You know, you got to have somebody to learn from. And I've been very lucky, very fortunate to have, you know, mentors in my life from Ron Shank being the first to, 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 to Wayne Rath and spending time with Rob McKenzie, Dan Kelly, all the senior faculty. Um, so you, you, you got to have a mentor. Um, and you got to surround yourself pe- with, with, with people who have different skill set than you have. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky. You know, Michael, my partner, you know, he's got a different brain than I have. You know, I always tell people that it's like he and I have been married, you know, for, for, for 25 years. And we're, we're still together. But he, he, he had, brings a different skill set than I have. You know, he, he likes doing certain things um, that I don't like to do. And, um, and I, you know, so... Um, Ideally, you start surround yourself with people that are better than you, because you can't do everything, right? You you, you just can't do it all. So you got to have it. You know, you need a you know a good accountant, a good lawyer, a good financial person, a good therapist, you know, a good manager, um, because you can't do it all. And when you start out, you don't have the finances to pay all these people. So you'll find out what you're good at, find out where your deficits are, and get some people who do it better than you, are, or better better than you can. Yeah. And since you mentioned that, do you just see patients or you still have to do some admin work or other stuff like that on the, in the clinic? Yeah. So, so by and large, I see patients. I mean, that's all I do. I've got a full schedule. It's, it, 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 and you know, that, that, that's my strong suit is seeing patients. So we had no connections neither michael or myself are from central new york it's not like we've been here all our lives and um you know it, I, i'm not real good at marketing when we first bought the office i tried to do that you know try to take lunch to the doctor's offices i just wasn't good at it i'm like i just some people are good at it and and if you have a marketing person so i just i just i'm like I, I, i'm coming to their office to ask them to send me patients, encourage them to say, like, I just, I was always under the guise of, you know, I haven't met you. I'd like to meet you, you know, you know, give us a chance. We'd like to see your patients, but, um, they just weren't all that interested. I always felt like I was just a carrying their luncheon for them. I, I get all irritable and aggravated. And I'm like, you know, they don't know what we know. They do not know what we know. You know, I don't know about high blood pressure and diabetes. I don't know how to do surgery. I don't know that. But I know how I know how conservative management of back pain, you know, and so I wasn't good at it. And what what I really, you know, we figured it was just going to be, and it has been a very slow, steady growth for us. If you've got a good product, you know, word of mouth is huge, you know. And I, the very first uh, webinar that the McKenzie Institute USA did, they, it was mine. And it was called, and I was asked to do it. It was called Best Practices for Private Practice. And Lauren, one of our therapists, Lauren Earl, who works for us, she said, how are you going to get an hour, an hour and a half? How are you going to get an hour on, and a half out of asking, of, of, telling, of asking patients, geez, if you know anyone in needs therapy, tell them about us. Because that's about all the marketing we do. You know, when, when a patient has a good outcome, geez, if you know anyone, tell them about us. She goes, how are you going to get an hour and a half out of that? And I said, well, I'll figure out something. But, uh, but, but in all, in all honesty, we've encouraged all our therapists to, 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 you know, patients that before they're done, you know, you, they're thanking you. Thanks so much. You helped me so much. Listen, if you, if you know somebody, please tell them about us. And, uh, it sounded so awkward for me at first. And now it seems so natural, you know, you know that, that, that they, they really appreciate what you did. Listen, if you appreciate it, let, let somebody know. And it's just been that way. And if you can hang in there long enough where that builds, everybody you see is going to say, you know, it's a, a pyramid scheme, right? I mean, everybody's going to tell us somebody, and they tell us somebody, and it just grows and grows and grows. But if you can hang in there long enough, um, 
Nobody can hurt you. You don't have to worry about this doctor not sending patients, that doctor sending patients. They get mad at you because you didn't do ultrasound on them. They, they, you're not the flavor of the month anymore. They, they, they fell in love with the new practice. You don't have to worry about that. Because they're not sending you to the patients. It's the patients that are driving your business. And in all honesty, that's what's, what's happening. There, I'm very lucky. There are a few docs, a few docs around that really appreciate what I do, and they'll send them to me. Uh, but by and large, you know, you know, if the doctor doesn't have a vested interest, vested interest in your practice, they'll say, "Oh, look in the phone book," or "Look who's close," or um, you know, they'll give you a list of ten different practices, and um, so. It's really just been internal kind of marketing uh, that, the, you know, uh, try to treat the patients the way you want to be treated, you know, return their phone calls. You get just just treat them like you want to be treated and um, and make sure that because I've had patients ask me, oh, are you accepting new patients? Oh, I better be because the, the ones I'm seeing now better get better and go away, you know, so I can't have anybody if I don't see new patients. So, yes, we see new patients. Please tell people about us. Yeah. And I, it doesn't feel weird if, because you help the patient. So you're just um, helping, uh, the, asking for referral, but because you helped him, you gave him something, and then you just um, expect them to talk, remember about you when they are talking with their friends and, and, and their family. So it's not like as awkward as like trying to go to the doctor, I guess. No, I I agree because that was very awkward for me because it, it it took a while but again they're thanking you right you really helped me well listen I helped you and you want because they want to help their friends and 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 everybody knows that one person you know that one person in in a friend group who tells everybody where to go you know they're the one who knows where where to go you know to the mechanic to the therapist you know and so you know not everybody's going to send your patient but all you got to hit is a few and 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 it, they and and if you get lucky. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna continue to send your patients over the years, um, but I agree with you. Um, it, it it's not awkward at all. But when you're not used to doing it, it it, it it's it was it was awkward at for first in, or at, at first. But uh, yeah, so I see patients, um, and um, you know because I'm there with the therapist, things will pop up. You know there'll be problems. You know th th this one has a problem with this one. This therapist is the secretary's man at this therapist. You know. So you you know kind of put out fires as they come up, um, but I don't have you know it's not as though I have a day set aside for administrative things or anything like that. I, I, I my schedule is just like any one of the other therapists who work with us. It's a it's a you know it's a just full, a good part. Yeah. Just seeing patients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Some days it doesn't seem like it's the good part, but it, but it, but. It, <laughs> and I was going to ask you like with in your experience with doctors. Um, do you feel like they are interested in general, like in learning about what to do and like how you can help their patients or they don't care as much? I don't think they care. Don't think they care. I, uh, that, that sounds, I, I, by and large, you know, if I was going to pick now, I, I told you, I know a few that do that, that really do, but by and large, not interested. Um, uh, they don't think it's important and, 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 and that goes the way of, for, for, for years, there was a, a, a McKenzie physician's course. There was a physician's course that was taught. It was a day and a half. Ron Donaldson, um, a non-operative orthopedic surgeon, taught the vast majority of the course. And it would be taught with a therapist, one of the faculty, and they would treat patients and reassess the patients. And uh, the course stopped because the interest was just not there. We couldn't get people in the door. Now, when they came, the, the feedback was good. It was a good course. They enjoyed the course. It was just hard to get them to the course. Um, you know, we, we, if I ever mentioned Charles April's name, uh, I, I, Marianne, are you familiar with Charles April? Are you familiar with his, his work at all? So he was a non, uh, he was an interventional radiologist in New Orleans. So he spoke all over the world. He's passed away, but he spoke all over the world on um, discograms, facet joint injections, SI joint injections. So he was in New Orleans. So people would go all over the Southeast to have injections by Charles April. And the, the referral was typically made by not by orthopedic surgeon who had inconclusive MRIs and CAT scans. So they want he needed some evidence to, to do surgery. So more invasive tests, let's do a discogram, let's the facet joint, the SI, let's figure out where this page coming from. So Charles April always said, I, I heard, you know, 
before he got involved in MDT because he did a study, a discogram study where Robin Redcalf examined most of the patients. I saw a few. Mark Miller, Scott Wowie, Greg Silva saw a few. Wayne Rass saw a few. I'm probably forgetting some names, but we had to predict what the discogram was going to say. Was it positive or negative? If it was positive, what level was it? What did the major fissure formation look like? What level was it? And was the uh, lesion, if it was a positive discogram, was it contained or not contained? So when he, when when, when uh, Charles April first presented his his research, Robert only saw 40 patients. Robert got 43 patients, all by 40 patients through the study all by himself. And he said, this man with his head in his hands, he comes to the same conclusion that I need a million dollar scanner to come to with just the MD of, MDT approach. But when you, when you hear, when, when Charles talks, when he would talk about MDT, he said, I heard Ron Donaldson talk about MDT or McKenzie. He goes, I didn't think it was important. I didn't pay much attention. You know, and I heard him talk again. I didn't think it was really important. Didn't pay much attention. But then when I heard him talk again, I thought, geez, if what he's saying is true, we should be able to figure this out. And that's how that study came to be. So I think Charles's kind of, his experiences, my experiences, they don't really think it's all that important. You know, um, I, I just, and, you know, I, I, if you are a internal medicine, if you're any kind of physician who refers to PT, I guess you got PTs knocking on your door all the time telling you why you should send them patients, you know, why you're the best. So, you know, they hear somebody else, why, why, why should they think different? So the, 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 you know, but, but, but I've, again, it has some, has some very good luck. My best luck has been with physicians that I treat. If I treat them now, they start to get it. You know, now they start to see what's going on. And they see that there's something here that's different that they don't know that they couldn't figure out. Um, so I've got very good luck with those doctors as referral sources. And I'm very lucky to have a doctor in town, Tom Maston, who um, his background is in family medicine. And he functions very much like pain doctors do. He does injections and medications, but he's credentialed in MDT. So it, you're right. So, so lucky. So if you see him, he refers me so many patients and, uh, he's such a good, honest physician and, and, uh, he appreciates what I do and I appreciate him. So I'm very lucky in that sense as well. But by and large, I think the answer is no, I don't think they really did. And that's why I stopped trying to appeal to them, you know, uh, not paying them rent. If, uh, you know, they're not, not, not if they don't own your practice, I mean, I, I hear that from patients or therapists all the time at the classes, you know, um, in their town, you know, but by and large physical, uh, physician owned physical therapy practices, the biggest practice in, in Syracuse is, is surgeon owned, physician owned, you know, so, you know, if they don't have an interest in you, they're, you know, so, so, so you've got to be good. You've got to stand out. There's got to be a reason to come to you. And that's why I appeal to the patient. Yes, exactly. Because it's so much competition. It's hard to depend on doctors because everybody's the same through their eyes, I guess. So there is not much difference from like a skilled therapist and if you have outcomes and just anyone. So you have to be really good at what you do so your patients will refer other patients, right? Yeah, I, I I agree. And and how do you, can you do like... um um give them a good treatment being busy in the clinic because you take insurance so assume you're busy how do you find that difficult to be able to treat them the way you want to treat and give them the attention and all the tests being busy or is that something that comes with experience um how how do you see that how that happened in your clinic yeah it it, it, can, it can be a challenge you know i um so we run on half hour schedule with 45 minutes for an initial evaluation. Um, and, and by and large, you know, we do that to try to make sure we're in compliance with, you know, Medicare. If you see somebody for, if you're going to bill them for two units, you know, you see them for the half hour. Um, but I, but, but I could do it in a shorter period of time by and large. You know, in New Zealand, when we did the diploma program, we had 15 minutes for a follow-up and a half hour for initial evaluation. I mean, we were flying. Um, but I don't know how it is now, but in 1990, 
you know, the average duration of symptoms when a patient walked in the office was about seven to 10 days. They'd seen their family physician and they end up in PT. And you, so you were dealing with chronicity. You weren't dealing with patients who've had, well, failed surgeries, multiple MRIs, multiple doctor's visits, you know, and then you deal with the psychosocial. It was, it was really a mechanical presentation by and large. So you could get to the root of the matter quick. But, but you know, the diploma program helped me get to the quick. And, um, and with experience, you get better and better at it. So you can be really busy. You know, you can be busy. And I, and I think give the patients what they need. Um, you know, sometimes I don't need that much time. You know, when, when things are going nice, smoothly. Um, and sometimes you need more time, but you know, I, I, I got no, if I'm running behind, I've got no problem saying, listen, do 10 of these and I'm going to be right back. And, you know, okay. Now, and you go see somebody else and you come back and what happened when you did that? Okay. You know what? I mean, you don't have to be next to somebody while they're doing press up 18, 19 and 20, you know, as long as their technique is good, you, they know, and you know, they know what to expect. I try to stay with people as best I can, but you and me and everybody else in the real world, you're running around some days and uh, the days go by fast. But um, so, you, I mean, some days I, I say I feel like I'm a waiter, you know, I mean, you know, you just got to get get them in, get them out, make sure they're happy, make sure they're happy. You're turning those tables over because, because again, we, we do have to be busy. But, you know, I um, we, we try to make sure everybody gets the information they need, the time they need, so they understand what they need to do. And uh, I tell everybody, if you have any questions, call me. Forgot something, you forgot what you're supposed to do, you're having a problem, call me. Before the end of the day is over, I'll return that phone call. If I get a minute during the day, I will. But at the end of the day, at the very least, I'll return my phone call. So, um, yeah, it... It, it, I have the same challenges as you and everyone else has. It, 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 it can be busy, but we've got to be busy. And, and you see patients for 30 minutes, an average, like a normal visit? Correct. Yeah. And, you know, if I know I need, I need to see somebody tomorrow because the weekend's rolling around and I'm not sure and I've got no space, I'll look at my schedule and, you know, who do, who do I think is going to be doing pretty well, won't need a lot of my time, and I can, you know, double that patient up perhaps. But I, I make my schedule. I, I, I don't have Perfect. my patient schedule with the secretary. We're never leaving all schedule. So um, I like that control too, knowing where I can put people and double them up. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how, another question from uh, audience. How do you sell, sell a home exercise program to a patient? Because we know that it's very important for them to be compliant. So, do you have any strategies that you use? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, whoever gave you the question, they're they're right. You know, you got to sell. I mean, so on Power Day, where you know, where 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 people who aren't familiar with MDT, they're taking the class for the first time. You treat a patient. You give the patient instructions. I want you to do X, Y, or Z every two hours. That's a shock for a lot of the therapists because they're not used to giving patients instructions. To, to do an exercise that frequent, you know, to be that okay. mindful of the posture. So invariably that question will come up, you know, how do you get your patients to be compliant? My answer is always, always the, the first thing is you have to be right. You have to be right in your classification and your instruction to that patient. So now, you know, if you're right in this, and the patient sees the benefit in doing it, they'll do it. You know, by and large, they'll do it. Now, it may take a visit or two or three for them to to, to see it as clearly as you do. Um, but it, it it it's it's demonstrating that cause and effect, whether it's the, the the cause and effect of changing the posture, the cause and effect of the exercise. I mean, it's not unusual for me to point out to a patient if they were able to eliminate, abolish their symptoms with an exercise when they're up and walking around. Before they're walking out, I say, "Listen, you came in with symptoms. You're walking out without it." And I didn't put my hands on you. I didn't do anything to you. Uh, you can repeat this experiment, you know, at home, at work. If the symptoms return, I want you to immediately do this, see if it's able to go in addition to the every two hours. Um, I, 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 I think therapists sometimes can be their worst, own worst enemy because they think, you know, they can always do better in the sense that, well, listen, th th this worked, you know, the press ups abolished her pain, but. Let's get their core strong and let's heat them up and let's have them do this exercise. And then, so they throw everything in them and the patient loses the, the connection of what did what. 
So I would, so I will have, you know, therapists come up to me and that's the day we do what you do. You know, we do what, okay, we're a McKenzie clinic. We do that. But what's wrong with, in addition to it, the patients like the way heat and stim feels, what's wrong with when they're all done putting that on? Listen, everybody wants to be stronger. What's wrong with having them do some planks and, you know, bridges? And, well, well, nothing's wrong, you know. How, how, however, if all I did was tell that patient to sit up erect and show them one exercise that made their pain go away and told them, listen, you got to do that one exercise and you got to sit this way because the pain went away, who's got a better chance of their patient sitting up straight on the way home? Me or the patient who did that same exactly, I will give them the benefit of the doubt they did it every bit as good as I did. But they heated them and electrocuted them, did the weights. And, you know, that magic machine had to do something that vibrated my back. And, you know, he wouldn't be having me do all these strengthening exercises if there wasn't no benefit to it. So best case scenario, he does feel good when he drove home, but he doesn't. You know, it is hard to change habits. It's hard to gain compliance. So I think the the, the, the more simple we can be with it, the fewer the variables, um, the easier it is for us all to get to that end point. And I, and, I, and I think it's a great question because I don't think most therapists think their patients do their exercise or, or, or that postural correction is something that's achievable. And I think the way they do it typically is not because they're doing it wrong. You know, you know, your patient walks in on day two and you told them to sit erect and they're not sitting erect. You know, I ask them about their exercises, how often they've been doing it, what happens when you do it, what's it other, what else did I tell you to do it? And Oh, yeah, you told me to sit with that pillow. No, I didn't tell you to sit with the pillow. You need you to sit up erect, and that pillow will make it easier. Oh, I didn't say, I've been doing it. I've been, I've been, no, no, you haven't, because you're not doing it now. And if you're going to do it for 10 minutes during the day, it's going to be in front of me, the guy who told you to do it. And then they'll usually laugh and smile and say, well, I've been trying. I don't doubt you've been trying. And I don't expect it to be perfect today, because it, it, it takes three weeks to create a head, right? But I got to bring your attention. Now, what do you feel? There's oh, I got some pain in my layer. I sit up straight. That's better. You got to continue to emphasize and drive home that cause and effect. Make sure they get it. Um, because it's not going to happen by telling them. This. You know, it's, gonna, it's not going to happen by giving them a lumbar roll or giving them a sheet exercises with a picture on it. You've got to consistently prove and demonstrate to that patient the benefit in doing it. Um, doing the exercise more frequently, you know. Um, I think we all have that conversation with the patients, you know, um, they're doing actually two, three times a day instead of six, eight times. Well, what happens when you do it? Well, I get, it, it, pain goes away, but it comes back. Well, okay. How long does it come, take to come back? You know, a couple hours, it's back. Well, what would happen if you did it every hour? You know, when, well, I probably wouldn't have any pain. Now you're starting to get it. I use an analogy. You don't wait till your car runs out of gas till you go to the gas station. So when you're doing your exercises, you're filling up the tank, right? It's buying you X amount of free time, right? Fill up the tank before you, however long it lasts with you. You know, if you're good for an hour, well, you're going to do the exercise every 45 minutes. You know? um, not forever. And I think that's an important thing as well. I know when I started out initially, I would lose patience because I somehow they got the impression that I was telling them that they had to do this forever, you know, and they would drop out. I, I, real early on, this is not a forever thing. You know, it's it's a for now thing. The better you are now, exercise wise, posturally, the faster you can resume your old life. The faster you can start slouching. You know, um, but in the future you'll have a balance. I I I I I think it helps when you tell patients. You know, I'm not here to fix your problem. I'm here to understand your problem. Because if we could understand it, fixing is easy. And I really think that's a crux of a large pro problem in, in, in healthcare is everybody's the expert, right? You go see the doctor, they're gonna to point to the x-ray, they're gonna to point to the MRI, and they're gonna tell you, well, Mrs. Jones, this is what you have, and this is what you need to do. And the therapist is gonna feel your back or test your strength or see how you move, and they're gonna tell you what your problem is. And in the meantime, they've seen 10 experts who have all told them 10 different things. No one's helped them. So when they come and see me, I gotta be different. And, and, I, and, I, and I think it helps when I tell the patient, listen, I recognize you are the expert on your problem. You're the only one who's been living with it for the set past six months, six years, however long it's been. I need to ask you some questions to gain an understanding of how it behaves. We're going to move you around and see how it behaves. And usually, I mean, you just see them kind of, they, 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 you get them on your side. You get, they, 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 get, they, they understand now, okay, this, this, this is going to be a different approach. And if we can find something that makes this pain go away, you know, you're going to sign up for it. No one's been able to help. And um, it's just different right from the beginning. And um, I, I think that 
if you can show them, listen, when you told me when it does this, the pain gets better. Well, when you move that way, you're right, it does get better. You're going to do a lot of that to keep it warm. I use the expression quite often, if we can find the move that makes it go away, it's like a magic pill. It's magic because there's not a pill out there that can make you feel better without a side effect, right? This is not going to hurt your stomach. It's not going to hurt your liver. Um, if we, uh, you can't overdo it. If it's the right move, the more you do, the better it is. Um, but you've got to be right. You know, uh, I think there are a lot of people who have a little bit of an understanding of what we do and they've got them doing these press ups every couple hours and it, the patient's not getting, but while you're not doing them enough, well, nothing good happens when they do it. They're not centralizing, they're, they're not lessening their, the intensity, they're not increasing their range of motion, but the therapist believes it's the answer and, 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 and that's what you got to do as opposed to seeing what happens, right? I try to be as objective as I can is nobody's getting instructions to do anything until we find out what makes them better. And um, understanding, right? And as you understand it, you got to teach the patient, teach the patient. And uh, maybe some of it comes with your hair getting grayer. You know, they trust you more. I don't know. But um, I think I'm getting better at being more succinct and, and making it clear to the patient what they need to do. And um, I'm getting better compliance. I mean, I, you know, listen, I have days and I got people that don't listen to me and not everyone listens and not everyone listens on the first day. But, but I also think, you know, when therapists encounter a, 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 a problem and the patient's not listening, they follow the path of least resistance, right? All right, let's put some heat on you. Let, you know, let's, let, let, let's start doing this or that. And uh, that's not what's going to happen with it. If I follow the move, it's beneficial. If they're classified as a derangement, I need to hold them accountable. I'm going to make a, and, you know, if they want to lay on the heat, they're not going to come back and see, you know. Uh, but what I've been very lucky, you know, I, at this point, I will only evaluate patients who ask for me when they make their appointment. So if they ask for me, I already have, I already have, you know, a, a, a good chance of success because they're coming in thinking good things are going to happen, right? I, you're supposed to be good. You helped my friend. You helped so-and-so. I'm supposed to see you. You, you already got three steps in the right direction. You know, when I first started out, there was a surgeon in, in Niagara County, and he'd say, yeah, they, he sent the patient to therapy, but the, what the message I got from the patient was, yeah, he said, you guys are aggressive. Don't hurt me. Right? Oh, so my me, goodness. So, so immediately, immediately, you're, you're not going to have success because the patient's already anxious about what's going to happen. So you do something that's at least a bit questionable, the patient's, oh, I'm not going to do that. Doctors said you guys might hurt me. As opposed to now, and it just takes a long time. So, you know, the lo the younger therapist, I'm saying, hang in there, it gets better, it gets better, it gets better, I promise. And so now the patient's coming with the thinking they're going to get better. And then such a big help to the therapist. They you need to be confident, right, in their treatment, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation therapy, physical therapy. You want to be confident in it. And when they walk in confident, we already got to hit start. Yeah, absolutely. And I expect them to listen. You know, I expect them to do what I'm asking. You know, and and if not, listen, why aren't you doing it? You know, whatever. And when you mention about proving the relationship between the exercise and the results that they have from that specific movement or position uh, for their home exercise compliance, in the beginning, do you just use MDT to make sure that they understand that? And then like maybe after you add other techniques or like how does it work in practical terms, like when you see your patients? So I'm not sure. So ask me that one more time and make sure I understand the question. Yeah. So when you, you mentioned that sometimes it's hard to um, make the patient understand that what make him better, it was the, 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 the McKenzie exercise versus the heat and the other techniques. So how do you make sure that the patient understands that is the exercise and that he needs to keep doing the exercise? Um, if you use other techniques together or you don't use it together until the patient gets better and then you start adding, like strengthening, adding other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's the latter. You, you got it exactly right. I'm only going to do MDT. I'm only going to add typically one variable at a time so that it's clear to the patient. Um, uh -huh. I think, it, it, I mean, if, if I can find a move, if I can identify their directional preference, if I can find the move that centralizes their symptoms, that's what they're doing, right? Um, I, so, and sometimes, you know, a patient will come, you abolish their symptoms. Able to centralize, abolish. Is that all I'm going to do? I go, 
I can't do any better than make it go away. The complaints you came in are, are gone. We found them. You're going to go test my hypothesis. You're going to come back and see me. And you're going to be better. You're going to be worse. Or you're going to be the same. It's going to be one of those three, one of those three things. Based on what you tell me, I'll know whether it's full speed ahead or we've got to change things. So, you know, I, I'm very strict as far as MDT. I mean, that, that, that's what I was taught. That's what I do. The more strict I am about it, the, the better the results I get. You know, I mean, trust the system. Don't complicate it with other things. Um, now, having said that, if, 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 and I don't know if this was part of the question or not, you know, my, my other tools beyond MDT, and I think, I, I, first of all, I think it's all MDT. I think everything I do, I mean, when we, we were there at the, uh, in New Zealand, Robin had a chronic pain program. Uh, patients had a failed, you know, outpatient therapy. They came and lived at the lodge for two weeks where he would examine them every day, tell them, he had them play a tennis, go for walks, like exercising, general exercise. So I, I think the MDT principles, I apply to everything we do. But but just look at a patient who's a derangement. So the four stages in the treatment of the derangement, we reduce it, we maintain it, we recover function, prevention. If the patient stalls in any one of, the, of those three stages, I think it's very appropriate to strengthen the patient you know, to address functional deficits, whether the, it's range of motion, strength. Um, and I've had, I've been surprised, you know, over and over through the, over and over through the years that, you know, you stall, geez, and then you start strengthening them, geez, and, 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 and they get better. And, and I don't think you can, blame, can, can, can attribute that to strength. I mean, you just don't get strong fast, but as soon as you start reactivating them, you know, something good happens psychologically where they're moving around and, Indeed, nothing bad happened. They start gaining confidence in, in the stability of their condition and of their spawn. So, you know, what used to be called the irreducible derangement, right? If it, if it, if I couldn't reduce it, typically it'd strengthen them, reactivate them, get them, get them lifting, get them active. You know, you can reduce the patient, but I couldn't maintain it. You know, despite, despite my best efforts, their best efforts, you know, they, they, they just continue to have their symptoms return and strengthen that patient. I could re reduce it. They could maintain it. But every time we recovered function, they would derange. I strengthened that patient as well. But but that I wasn't going to make that move until I maximized the benefit of MDT. What, but when I play a toad, I mean, you can only tell the patient so many times. You got to do your exercises more. You got to sit up straighter. They're doing it, and it's not changing. What other tools do we have? You know, typically stronger function. Um, I, I I go in the, in in that direction. Typically. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And do you use any pain neuroscience uh, to teach your patients um, independence through the MDT approach? I, I, I would say yes. I mean, I think so. I don't know what the pain neuroscience, the pain science people would say, but I, but over the pandemic, I took a lot of uh, distance education with pain science, Adrian Lau's stuff. And, um, you know, at, at, yeah, I think it's great. And but but I, I think the best pain scientist, best pain science therapist I ever saw was Robin McKenzie. You know, I mean, how 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 many times you know hurt does not equal harm. You know, um, knowing when to progress the patient's activity, always assessing symptomatic response. You know, when it becomes very clear it it, it that it's centrally modulated pain or no subplastic pain, I guess is the best term nowadays. You know, your McKenzie exam identifies that, you know, and, and it tells you this is not going to be a mechanical response. So it's, you know, graded activity, graduated uh, increase in their function, graded exposure. Um, that, that, that's the way to address it. But it's your MDT exam that tells you that that's what that patient needs. So something, you know, again, things I've heard over the years is somebody's taking a McKenzie course and, oh, I've, I've got this... Um, uh, accreditation and I've got this and this. So I'm going to do the McKenzie now, another tool in the tool belt. And, you know, whether it's me being sensitive or, or whatnot, I would say, well, you got it all wrong. MDT is, is, is the toolbox, you know, it is the tool belt. MDT tells you whether the patient needs an injection, whether they need surgery, whether they need pain science education, but only with our assessment, do you know what box to put the patient in? So um, the pain science, yeah, by all means, but it's for that specific patient. You know, um, a lot of patients, I think the assumption is made they have to be in pain because they've heard for 
X amount of months or years, and it's clearly chronic pain syndrome now, no plastic, but no one's ever given a good MDT examination. So, you know, 40% of chronic pain patients can centralize. You know, it's not the majority, but that's a big chunk. So they need to be given a good exam. And if they're not, if they don't behave mechanically, then treat them that way. But why, why, why treat them with something that's going to take months, if not years, to slowly and gradually change, you know, the way their brain perceives the pain, as opposed to we could fix you in days or weeks? You know, and, and people that are familiar with MDT, they might scoff at that comment. But those of us who've done it all know that you can see that change that fast. If the patients behave that way, if it is a derangement, regardless of how long they've had it. So everybody deserves a chance to get better fast to be an MDT responder. I mean, because these are mechanical problems until they're not. And when they're not, well, then they need to be treated differently. But to make the assumption that they are or aren't before you even examine the patient, you know, is it, maddening. To, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen until you start. That's why I don't know how, how you can assess a patient if you don't know MDT. Nobody's going to know what's going to happen until you move back to the twist. But everybody makes an assumption based on what you see on an image or your beliefs. I don't know what happens to everybody's core in the past 10 years, in the past decade, but supposedly nobody's got a good core nowadays, and that's the root of all back pain. You know, I mean, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know what's happened. But if you believe that's the case, that's the case. If you bow at the altar of the SI joint, everybody's got an SI joint problem. You know, uh, and, and if you have a, you know, a, a superficial knowledge of MDT, you think everybody's got a disc problem and you got to start doing pressures. But, but the examination will reveal with the patient. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And measuring outcomes. Yes. So do you measure outcomes? Any suggestions for the therapies? So, so, so outcomes are measured in the sense that, you know, everybody gets a functional status survey on the way in and we try to get it, get everybody, you know, we know when their last visit is or when they need a progress on everybody as the same functional status survey. Everybody's given us a subjective report of their improvements. Um, and any, you know, um, baseline functional tests that we've done, but I don't, we don't, um, keep our outcomes. We, we, we don't keep track of our outcomes. I don't know what our outcomes are. Um, as I said, you know, our, our reimbursement is low. We've got to be busy. You know, we've talked about it over the years. We did photo for a period of time. Um, but it's like, why, why are we doing this? You know, I mean, it's, and I know there's different areas of the country are different, but my, my, what I, from what I could tell you, nobody cares what your outcomes are. The insurances, they've got to figure it out. They know exactly what to pay us, how they're going to make money, how, how they're going to divvy the visit, visits out. I'm not aware of anybody in this part of the state, central or western, you are going to the insurances and saying, um, listen, we've got good outcomes. We deserve more luck. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, 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 they don't care. So, uh, my time is such that it's, I'm, I'm interested in what I'm doing with the patient and I try to take each patient individually. And uh, so I can't tell you what percentage of my outcomes are fair, good, and poor. That If I had more time, that uh, you know, I could put it into that, but I, I don't have those numbers. Yeah. And yeah. I don't even feel bad about it's saying hard. it. It's hard. It, yeah. It's hard, and and I, it's hard because you're busy trying to do so many things and so many notes and yep. how are you going to keep track of everything? With the load that we we have in clinics, I, I I leave the office every day exhausted. If I thought there was going to be a benefit in it, I would do it. If I just was, you know, so people that's their thing. They like knowing that. They like statistics. They that they would like to know. Okay, but but that, that that's the least of my concerns at this point. That is so low on the priority uh, of run. my business running day to day that um, yeah. We it's ideal. I, it would be awesome to have, but like on the day to day, it's very hard to make that happen. I agree yeah. with you. I agree with you. And and again, there are companies out there that will do it for you. Like you say, it's computerized, and I, we don't make them. We we don't have that much margin of, of, of profit, right? To, we pay everybody that's just that I'm going to pay somebody else to give me an outcome that is useless to me. That, that, that does not. Uh -huh. Oh, well, and it, uh -huh. I, I I just no. Yeah. Some people yeah. say wrong, you know, and it could benefit you and you could be a better, better, better clinician. Well, I, I continually try to improve my clinical skills by, you know, learning colleagues and, 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 and 
continuing education and, and practicing in the office and the clinic. But um, yeah, I, 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 it, I would love to come on here and tell you I've got them and this is why we got them and this is what they are. But I, I Yeah. And why do you think that back pain haven't gotten better outcomes in the PT world? Well, 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 PT can't, they can't agree on how to treat the patient, right? Everybody's got their own vested interest. And so, you know, if, if we thought everybody was doing like McKenzie, right? I mean, we, we get wrapped up, at least I do in my own McKenzie world. I think everyone's doing this. I know that's not how it is. I just know that's, you know, so you got everybody doing different things. And I, I can't really believe I've been teaching it this long and, it, and it's still not the way patients are addressed, you know? Um, the, the, the more research on centralization than anything else, to my knowledge, it's the only thing that's got any predictive value in an exam of whether the patient's going to do well, not do well. Um, I just was listening not too long ago to the podcast you did with um, uh, Steve and... Uh, Steve, May, Steve May. May. Steve May. Yeah. And he's talking about centralization. He's like, he goes, it's the only thing that's been shown to be pretty... Like, you'd be foolish not to... Yet, yeah, yeah. for whatever reason, you know... People don't think MDT, there's anything to it. Like, you know, I've been around long enough. You know, nobody thought McKenzie was right, right? He's fo he's, a, he's a fool. He's wrong. He, there's nothing to it. And then eventually, when it's acknowledged, oh, centraliz centralization has got good evidence. You know, directional preference has good evidence, you know, in the, in the guidelines. Oh, well, that was not even McKenzie anymore. No one even mentions his name. It's just directional preference. It's just centralization. Um, no one even acknowledges that in 7DT. Um, so, I, you know, I mean, you've got everybody doing something different. Um, you've got everybody with different, you know, Rod, Rod Donaldson in his textbook, Rapidly Reversible Low Back Pain, tried to address that issue. And all these different stakeholders, right? Nobody really wants anything to change. Insurance companies are fat and happy. Orthopods are making, you know, they're happy doing their surgery, making their money. And uh, therapists are trying to scrap, you know, uh, you know, tr we're all trying to eat one another to just try to stay, uh, stay alive and, and, and um, keep your practice thriving. But um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a difficult question and probably be beyond my scope to answer. But, you know, there, there's no standardized method of treatment or care at this point, right? Everyone's going to do it different. Everyone's going to examine the patients and say, find something different with, with the patient. So I think that's the biggest problem. You know, we took the OCS, all the faculty took the OCS a few years back. And, you know, what do you study? Well, you got to know everything. And then how do you study everything when there's no standard of care? There's no standard of practice when it comes, you know, you've got MDT teaching you something, Maitland teaches you something else, uh, Paris teaches you something else, you know, uh, Mulligan teaches. So there's all these different thoughts, but, but MDT really has the assessment that sets itself apart. I mean, there's a lot of different treatments. We can the, the assessment. The assessment will, uh, uh, Charles April, you know, went on record saying everybody deserves an MDT assessment. Everybody will bene benefit from the assessment. Not everybody will benefit from the treatment, but everybody deserves the assessment. It's just that structure. You have some structure to follow, you know, the, the step by step, and you know what the results mean. You can interpret them and use them to your treatment. 2012, we got 28 branches around the world, something like that. And it's nice to think that, you know, somebody in Brazil is doing it the same way as they're doing in the United States. And if you, and we all go through the same learning curve, you know, when you hear my story, it's very similar to this faculty member, that faculty member, you, you know, I sell my story. I'm watching course participants in the class. We all go through the same curve, learning this stuff. That's how part C first came about, you know, or it started with 15 common problem areas. Not getting that in range, not getting that or getting that in range too soon, not recognizing the relevant lateral compart. You know, we all it takes a long time to get good at it too. You know, I think I think PT burnout is real. I think it's fast. I think you know, I, I read a statistic not too long. I forget the number, but a lot of therapists are out of the profession after like three years time. You know, if you're not if you if you if you don't find something that works with the patients and you you feel like you're not. I was almost out after you, but it feel like you're not helping in any way. It's frustrating. Um, but it just, you don't get good overnight. It takes time and practice. And I know I'm better this year than last year. And I'll be better next year than this year. 
Um, one thing I haven't said today that I always say when I'm teaching, if you can walk in the office interested, interested in the patient in front of you, you're better than 90% of our colleagues. You know, because I think people just have to sleepwalk through their day. And, well, this is what they got. This is what you do. If you get better, great. And if you don't, okay, well, we try. Not everybody gets better. Um, but, you know, to go come first full circle in private practice, you know, we're going to, I, we got to try to do our dire to, see, to to help that patient because that patient's going to come away with a good or bad experience. And we rely on those good experiences to, send, to, to, to build our practice. So I'm always trying to figure that puzzle. Um, so if you're interested in the patient, you're going to be better than most. Um, and I used to be so critical of the PT profession for that. Um, but as I've gotten older, I, I think it's teachers and doctors and lawyers and judges and cops. I think mediocrity kind of rules the world, you know. And um, I think very few people really are passionate about what they do and want to get better at. Yeah, and that's, I guess, I assume that that's what PTs would want to do and be, just be curious about their patients. And maybe part of it is because they lack that structure that makes it more difficult to follow through the steps and be curious about what's going to happen next and trying to figure it out, having the right tools to try to figure it out what's happened with the patient, I guess. I, I, I would like to think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do you feel like even with like better outcomes, like than average and having the patients and being a really good clinician, is it still hard um, to get um, cash clients? So, uh, again, I, uh, you know, you and I were talking briefly before we went on. Some of my colleagues and, and friends are doing very well with cash-only business. Um, they, they've done a great job with it. I, 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 you know, Central New York, not a real wealthy community. I think people call and typically the first question is, do you accept my insurance? You know, not realizing that their co-pays are pretty large anyhow. You know, the insurance doesn't pay much. They pay most. Um, we could be more efficient. It would probably cause them less, cost them less if they paid cash for the whole thing because it'd be fewer visits. But again, I don't think people are going to think of that through that thoroughly. Um, so I, I um, we're busy. The people call. You know, they 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 they, they ask for me. But it's typically most of it's. I mean, the vast majority is through insurance. People will pay cash, but it's a small percentage. Um, I, I, I can't answer the question because I haven't tried to go cash on. I don't know how it, how it would be, but um, I, uh, I, I've been so long in the insurance model and, and we've got therapists, you know, at different locations. So this, this is how it's going to be for me. I don't, I won't, I won't have a cash practice. Yeah. I think it's a lot of like the culture, how the culture is, because as you said, if the patients knew that they could pay and, and get better quicker and fear visits, um, they don't even realize that they pay that much with copay. So, I mean, it's hard to change their mindset and show them that even like being that great, being the best therapies and the best outcomes, I think it's really hard to change that I agree. cultural aspect. I agree. Um, if, if you're, you know, it, it's funny if you're in a place where people got a lot of expendable money and, 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 and uh, a lot of wealthy people, it's almost... The, the, the flip side of that is, is kind of true too. Like you almost have to, the more you charge them, the better they feel the treatment is, right? Like if, it, if it's this expensive, it's got to be worth it, you know? Um, but uh, I, I just, I mean, it, it, you, you've got to inter interview somebody else to get those answers. I don't have those answers. <laughs> uh, I just, I compare like with Brazil, the city that I'm from. Where, it's very where are you city are you from? So I'm from Florianópolis, it's like South Brazil, um, and it's like a good city uh, with, I think people have more money than probably average, and everybody knows if they want a better outcome, they're going to pay for PT. So it's more cultural, the, 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 the cash, the practices are cash because the, 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 fees, the insurance doesn't reimburse almost nothing to the, the physical therapist is ridiculous. It's way, way worse than here. So the PTs, they have to see private because they, they can't survive with insurance. And then becomes the culture of patients know that the insurance treatment, they're gonna 
have a lot of other patients together because the, the, the PTs have to see um, a lot of patients at the same time, um, not having a great treatment. So if they want to get a good treatment, they're going to have to pay for it. And they already know. And it's fairly common. Most practices are private with cash. Got it. Uh, so I think it's like a lot of the, the cultural difference too. Yeah. Depending on the area, also people have to have money because then they they can pay anyways. But, right. uh, um, okay. Well, we've been talking for a long time. Let me transition to my final questions. Before I ask you the final questions, do you have any anything else that you want to add to what we've been talking about? The the your business model, or anything? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. So, resource of information. Do you have anything that you recommend? Uh, PTs to go um, that you like in particular. Well, listen. You know what I'm gonna. You know what I'm gonna say. Um, when I when I teach the classes, I ask who has Robin's textbook. One or two people will raise their hand. I mean, th th this this and this could be part C or part D. This this is what your this is going to be your primary means of treating the patient, and you don't know the textbook. Yeah, I mean. To, that's okay. just ba basic stuff, right? Um, I, I think, you know, the XPA study that has come out, Richard Rosedale uh, and others, uh, the XPA study. My God, that's a, a, I think, fascinating study. You know, things that we've suspected, you can put a number to it now. You know, 43% of extremity symptoms referred to PT4 extremity problems are right spinal. You know, get your head around that, that, you know, everybody who walks in the office, you know, with an extremity problem, clearing the spine is standard operating procedure. People think they know what tennis elbow looks like, what Achilles tendinopathy looks like. No, you don't. No, you don't. You got to clear the spine first. And uh, you'll be, if you're just, if just doing that regularly, you're just, your mind will be blown. You know, on, on a weekly basis, you're going to see someone that you can't believe it was their spine, but it was. You know, so um, recently, that's what really gets my attention. That's what I've been talking a lot about, thinking a lot about is the XBOS study. But the textbooks, no, no one has the box. You know, how, how is this, how are you a professional? This is what you're going to do. And it's your first line of treating patients and you don't have, and Robin's family doesn't need the money. Nobody, it's just, I'm not trying to sell his books for, but that, you know, you got, got to know the method. Um, all the research is all in, 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 in the in, uh, table of contents or uh, in the uh, bibliography in the back, all, all, the, all the relevant research to what we do. But, um, you know, there, there, there's uh, the McKenzie Institute website. There, there's lots of information on there as far as research relevant to MDT. Uh, the, 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 the podcasts, you know, what you're doing. I mean, it's, I think it's so easy nowadays to stay up to date. And, and, and if you have an area of interest, you know, to delve into it. But uh, yeah, very good. Go up to the basics. Yeah. Uh, that, that's me. You, I'm, you can't get any more basic than me. <laughs> and what would be the best advice you can give to clinicians that are starting their careers? Get a mentor. Find somebody. Find somebody who looks like they know what they're doing. Um, yep. Get, I, you know, learn from them. Learn from them. Learn from them. And um, I, I think I think that's the best thing. You know, find out what you're interested in. You know take classes, you know, always get better. Um, yeah. And my final one, I think you already kind of answered, what personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to be a successful physical therapist? You mentioned being interested, so that's the, I know it's one thing. I think you got to have a sense of humor, believe it or not. And you got, and you got to, you got to, you got to be humble. You are humbled every day, you know, but by, by, by things you can't figure out. You know, I always say, as I walk out of the office, so some days and the sun shines on me and I feel like, you know, bring, bring me the masses, you know, cause I can heal, you know, cause you had a great day and you figured out all these problems. And there are days I walk out of the office and I feel like I shouldn't even been paid. Like, I don't think I helped anybody today. Like, I don't think I figured anything out today. You know, you're, you're constantly, you know, humbled by, by, by what you couldn't figure out. And when you think you got it all figured out, some something happens and let you know you don't have to figure it out. And you gotta be able to laugh at yourself. We all make mistakes and um, you know, try your best. And uh I th I think that's you know 
you, 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 the desire to get better, you know, get better. And um, you, you never know it all. And um, you can always learn. And uh, yeah, I, I, I guess those are good thoughts, good qualities, I guess. It's good to hear that from someone that's been teaching for 30 years. It's comforting. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm telling you the truth. And, uh, you know, I was just with Robert Metcalf a couple months ago. We did a, a, a clinical decision making class. And, you know, we've got a lot of common uh, experiences. And, and, he, and he says this, you know, says the same thing. You know, I mean, it's just constantly learning, constantly getting better. But, oh, yeah, the, you know, there's frustration when you can't figure. You think you got something right, you don't. And uh, that, that's always happening. That's always happened. So that that should all you should, you should always be striving to get better, and you can't help everybody, but you should be helping more people than you did before. Well, uh, Dana, if people want to learn more about you or contact, is that a way that they can find you? Sh sure, they, you found me. <laughs> I mean, my Google. my my email. Yeah, my email is probably the best way. Probably, I guess Dana D A N A Summit S U M M I T P T. So Dana Summit PT at gmail.com. If anybody has questions for me, sure. Yeah, they could find me there. Awesome. Other, other other than that, they could find me in my office in Manlius, New York, which is outside Syracuse every day, you know, or at a class teaching. Yeah. If you have anyone that needs help there, send them the way, your way. <laughs> there, there you go. Thank you very much for that plug there. Uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, to come here and share your knowledge. I'm happy to finally have done it. I enjoyed meeting you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, you take care. <laughs>